Guys, welcome to the I Love Seville Show. My name is Jerry Miller. It's great to be with you on a Thursday. Thank you kindly for joining us. We are live in Charlottesville, the Commonwealth, the country, and the world on the I Love Seville Network. Phenomenal program lined up for you. We're going to talk uh, some politics. We're going to introduce you to one of the candidates that's running as a Democrat in the 5th District, challenging Denver Riggleman, the incumbent Riggleman has his own issues with the Republican Party, which we will cover here on the program. Today's guest, however, uh, someone I think that you're, you're going to get you know, excited about. Um, I'm excited to introduce you to him. His name, John Lesinski. He's going to join us in about 17 minutes on the program. We'll talk about his platform, introduce you to the viewing public. I have five different, introduce him to the viewing public. I got five different states watching the show as we speak. We'll just kind of uh, talk X's and O's. You know, I just want to have a conversation with John, two guys over a white picket fence in the neighborhood, just chatting about some of his goals and aspirations. We also have Eliza Whiteman on the broadcast. She's going to join us at about 1.20. She's the owner of a fabulous yoga studio in Charlottesville in Central Virginia, Fly Dog Yoga. Not only an empowered um, entrepreneur, uh, businesswoman, uh, someone who's creating jobs for the community, but she's pivoted her model because uh, of COVID from in-person to digital and virtual classes. We'll talk about that with the lies on the broadcast. We're an advertising agency at I Love Seville and VMV Brands. We're most known for this show and this network, which reaches a little, a little over a quarter million people. Um, and those are backed, metrics backed. Um, but we, we pride ourselves in not only connecting with you through this platform, but working side by side with small business owners from our satellite office in New Providence, New Jersey, all the way to Asheville, North Carolina, most of our clients here in uh, the Commonwealth, two of our favorites, Scott Wagner Chiropractic and Sports Medicine, and Interstate Pest and Service Companies. Interstate is a four-generation strong family business, almost 100 team members, and I was with Mr. Wells, the second generation, the, the owner of the business yesterday, as NBC29 was covering his business, Okay, and covering how he's had success and pivoted the model in COVID. And I was so impressed with Mr. Wells of Interstate and his commitment to his team members and the community and safety and standards. It was impressive. Same with Dr. Wagner. Chiropractic care, physical therapy, sports medicine. Dr. Wagner's changing people's lives. I've worked alongside that man's business for eight years. It's impressive. Now, we do this show. There's three of us that do this. Judah Wickhauer is our director. Um, Lauren Linsky helps on the back end with um, content and distribution and syndication of our shows on social media. And of course, I host the program. I want to thank Judah and Lauren for being a part of the show as well. Judah, I think we're ready to start headlines. And I think undoubtedly the headline that you should be following um, right now is right here in our home and in the 5th District. And let's start with the Republicans. And Judah, let's go to this camera over here before you put the headline on, please. Um, COVID-19 and this pandemic has shadowed the 5th District con congressional race. We have been so, um, you know, almost in quicksand trying to figure this out, COVID-19, whether it's from our businesses, whether it's can, I take our, can we take our two-year-old out and play with other kids? Can your kids play with other kids? Can we go to the grocery store? Um, we got to get our mask on. We have to socially distance. We've been so focused just on survival and COVID-19 that I think the marketplace and the voting base has almost forgotten a race is happening in the 5th District, an important one. We have an incumbent in Denver Riggleman who, without question, is being ousted by his party right before our eyes. And Judah, put the headline on screen, and when you come out of the headline, we'll go to this camera here, my friend. Riggleman is asking, in fact, he got his attorneys involved and did an appeal with the Republican Party about moving from a convention to a primary. He wants a primary where a lot of voters can vote instead of a convention where a small amount of delegates can vote because Riggleman right now is on the outs with his party because he officiated a same-sex marriage. Because of that, the old guard in the Republican Party is doing its best to push the incumbent Denver Riggleman 
out of Congress and then push Bob Good into the seat. Good claims that 60% of delegates will support his platform and his candidacy. The fifth is so gerrymandered, the Republicans have a huge advantage. So this backroom deal-making, where you go from primary to convention to control what happens, you do it in a, in a Campbell County church that's in the backyard of Bob Good. That's another thing that concerned me. Okay? And you do it in a drive-by setting with your car. I guess you have to do it. Literally, people go up to the spot. They cast their votes out their window. Someone counts the votes. And then you have the person representing the Republicans. And, and, and how about this one? And this was in the progress. Was it yesterday? I think it was in the progress yesterday. Riggleman appeals to the Republican Party about changing from a convention to a primary. He loses this appeal this is crazy. This is freaking crazy. He loses this appeal, and I'm looking at the story right now. Was it 18 to 17? 18 to 17, he loses the appeal, okay? Um, three members who voted of the 18, this is crazy. Three of the voting 18 are paid by Bob Good's campaign in some capacity. Good Lord. Control who gets on the ticket. Do it in a, in, 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 in a way where it's going to be done in the backyard of the guy you want on the ticket. You're doing this because one of the guys officiated a same sex. This is 2020 in the fifth, and it's nuts. I mean, this is a movie script. And front page, 6 p.m., 10 p.m., 11 p.m. newscasts. I mean, social viral on face and, Facebook and Instagram. The only reason it's not, it's because of COVID-19. I'm following it. You should be following it. Now, now how about the Democrats? It's a, it's a crowded field, and I respect anyone that's running. RD's going for a second, a second rodeo, a second chance. John Lisinski, I'm going to introduce you to in T minus 11 minutes. Cameron Reb, the doctor, and Claire Russo. From my, from my standpoint, as someone who is, follows storylines closely and keeps his pulse or his finger on the temperature of the street in Charlottesville and around the 5th, I look at the Democrats as having obviously an uphill battle because of the gerrymandered district and the historical voting track record of the 5th, but also because COVID has, has kept the spotlight from being on these four people as it should have been. So Dr. Cameron Webb, of the four, just one man's opinion, perhaps has navigated the lack of congressional um, spotlight for this race, the lack of spotlight, by positioning his career um, as a doctor and what he's doing with Dr. Bell, a weekly podcast where he's analyzing COVID-19. And put the SIVO Weekly headline up so people can see the faces of the de Democrats, Judah. Please, Judah Wickhauer is our director. Put that headline up. Cameron Webb, the doctor, of the four, one man's opinion, and I'll ask John about this, I think to this point has done the best of getting the brand out there, and he's indirectly and strategically getting his brand out there by leveraging his platform as a doctor. It's intelligent. And being a voice of reason that you can trust in the community. It's very smart. That's good face time for him. So he's building his brand. I, I own an advertising agent. We have 113. He's building a brand through that. Smart. We'll see what R.D. and John and Claire can do. John's on today. Cameron's on tomorrow. We'll reach out to Claire and R.D. as well. Riggleman um, is going to join us on the show. I, I'm, I'm a fan of Riggleman because of his approachability. I'm a fan of Riggleman because in some ways Riggleman says, like, you know, I'm going to do this my way. I'm not going to stick to party lines. This is what I'm going to do. But those same things that I think got Riggleman voted and elected, those same qualities of approachability and roll up your sleeves and I'll sit next to you and have a bourbon and a cigar and a likable guy, those same things of I'm going to do it my way are what's now crazy is backfiring in the man where his party is literally kicking him to the curb. And I'm curious, would he even consider running as a libertarian? If the Republicans say, hey, I'm just curious. Um, another topic I want to talk about, John uh, Lesinski is going to join us in T minus eight minutes on the program, seven minutes and change to be in fact. The, we have a clear cut 
clear-cut problem that is uh, shaping up that is not really getting a lot of attention. And this clear-cut problem is Albemarle County and the city of Charlottesville, we're facing a, a, a ginormous budget deficit for the next fiscal year. Albemarle County's deficit is $50 million at least with a working budget of 400 mil. So ladies and gentlemen, you got a working budget of 400 mil, you should, and you're facing a deficit of 50 mil plus, 50 at this time. That's if the economy starts reopening and rebounding and recovering. We don't know what's gonna happen, although from what I see in downtown Charlottesville where our building is at and where our studio is at, I see that the spots in the parking space is getting full again. The parking index would indicate people are returning to the city and to downtown, okay? But I wanna get back to the budget. You're facing a $50 million budget deficit for Almoral County, a $10 million plus for Charlottesville. Charlottesville's working budget is $200 million. $10 million short, you're talking 5% at least. So you need to start getting creative and entrepreneurial and figure out, as an entrepreneur, as an owner of a couple of businesses and some downtown real estate right here, I think creatively to, to, to fill the leaks or to, to, to make sure the leaks aren't getting worse, to, 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 to keep the hemorrhaging from happening, to keep the bleeding from stopping, and to get the ship going in the right way. So Neil at the Free Enterprise Forum, Neil Williamson is the president. Put the headline on, Judah. I'd encourage you to go to the Free Enterprise Forum if you have any um, interest in development and policy and how our municipalities work from an uh, inside standpoint. Neil covers it really well. Albemarle County asking the right retail questions. I'm going to give you the Cliff Notes version of this and then encourage everyone to go to the Free Enterprise Forum online and read the story so you guys can also get empowered and also get educated and also understand what your county is doing. Remember, Charlottesville and Albemarle County are intertwined. When Charlottesville struggles, Albemarle County struggles. When Albemarle County struggles, Charlottesville struggles. They're intertwined, along with the revenue sharing agreement. They're neighbors, they're next door, they're adjacent. There's barely a line that people even acknowledge outside of local government. So the county is considering how to keep retail leakage, according to Neil's report, retail leakage from happening in Central Virginia. Retail leakage, and Neil gave a great example. He drove to Harrisonburg on a Sunday. I believe he leaves in Green or Albemarle. Correct me if I'm wrong. He drove in Harrisonburg on a Sunday to Home Depot to get a sander. Is that right? To rent a sander, a floor sanding machine. That's called retail leakage. You want that business to stay in Central Virginia, but because of limited options on the market, you lost that, that purchase and the trickle-down impact that goes to schools and roads and police officers and EMTs, et cetera. So the county is asking the right questions according to the Free Enterprise Forum and this two-year consulting um, partnership that the Board of Supervisors have forged with a consultant to say, to ask, how can we get Al Morrow more retail friendly and attract more big box brands? So here's the here's here's let's get here's what it comes down to. Five percent, and somebody correct me if I'm wrong. In fact, I know I'm right. Five percent of Al Morrow designated for growth. The old guard in Al Morrow County. The OG has a mindset of fence around the county when one person moves out or one family moves out, one family can move in. Now that's hyperbolized, but you understand the not in my backyard mindset. I'm going to encourage everyone who's watching the show, whether in its live format or in its um, syndicated format, its podcast format, whatever way you choose to watch the show. Your schools don't have the money they need to operate. Your police force does not have the money it needs to function. Your fire department does not have the financial resources for stability for your health and safety. 
at a $50 million deficit for Albemarle County for fiscal year 2021, and that $50 million is going to be more, and at a $10 million deficit for the city of Charlottesville, and that deficit is going to be more when it's all said and done. I encourage anyone that's watching this program to broaden their perspective to strategic development because we're going to need the job growth, the job creation. We're going to need the revenue that's going to come from the real estate taxes. We're going to need the revenue that's going to come from the meals taxes, the retail taxes, because tourism and lodging, tourism and lodging, pillars, tourism, lodging, and restaurants. One shot on me here, Judah. Tourism, lodging, and restaurants are going to be so slow to recover. So slow to recover. So if you know your, your pillar sectors for economic stability, tourism, lodging, restaurants are going to be slow to recover. you got to find incremental revenue from a new source, and that new source must be strategic development. And so long city council, and for so long city council, and for so long our board of supervisors have been such opposed to the development that now you risk the, the, the recovery of a community if you don't change your mindset towards said development. Interesting topic. We'll cover that closely. A lot to cover on today's show. Eliza Whiteman. Eliza, if you're watching, no problem. Uh, we're all set. 120 for you, Eliza. She's the owner of uh, Fly Dog Yoga. Um, John Lasinski is going to join us. Judah, I'm going to Skype him now. He's a 5th District Congressional candidate. I just want to have a conversation with John and get to know him. We have five states watching. I have folks in Northern Virginia down in North Carolina and across the fifth watching. Judah, I'm Skyping him as we speak. I'm going to put my headset in so I can hear him. We have him on the line, Judah. Um, I'm excited to welcome this gentleman to the show. I have yet to speak to him. He is running for, for public office. Anybody that has the, uh, the gumption and the courage to do this, I admire. Um, John, you are live um, for a fair amount of people. We have six states now watching the show. Thank you kindly for joining us, and then I'll get out of your way. If you could, introduce, uh, introduce yourself personally before the platform. Introduce uh, who you are to everybody. Well, thank you, Jerry. First of all, thanks for having me on today, and uh, it's a pleasure to be uh, with all of your viewers and listeners here. Uh, yeah, I am John Lazinski. I'm running for uh, Congress here in our 5th District, uh, Democratic candidate. I'm in Rappahannock County. Uh, I'm a former county supervisor here and a former chair of our school board. I uh, first ran for the House of Delegates in uh, 2009. So this is not my first uh, rodeo, as they would say. I've been in elected office for, for eight years. I'm also a veteran. Uh, was four years of active duty in the Marine Corps and then spent another 22 years in the reserve. And I retired as a, a full colonel in 2006. I'm on a couple of veteran boards right now for the governor, uh, overseeing our policy and some of our programs for our Virginia veterans, which are, are really critical these days. So I guess you could say public service is in my DNA. Uh, I've uh, put the uniform on at 22 and between volunteer and elected service and um, you know, uh, serving with my community. Uh, been at it now for um, you know for for about forty years. Okay, fantastic. Um, I'm excited to get to know you here on the show. We have questions coming in. Put the questions in the feed. We'll pass them along to the candidate. Um, let's talk COVID first. How did your yeah. family manage COVID nineteen? Give us some insight. Well, I uh, I'm fortunate to be in uh, uh, in a rural area where I think managing COVID is probably uh, you know uh, it, it's. You know, it's more manageable, let's put it that way, uh, the physical separation. Uh, certainly, uh, you know, everything that we're, we're doing here, we're uh, respecting the experts, we're listening to the experts, we're keeping the social distancing. You know, when we are going out and about, I'll tell you a personal story. My daughter was overseas uh, when all of this broke. She actually was working over in the UK for the last four years, and she was um, traveling in the Far East, had to come back early, and then... Um, came uh, and uh, has been living with us now for about, about the last uh, month and a half, two months. So it's very, it's very personal, but our experience is, uh, is a rural experience. Uh, I understand that's very different, you know, very di different in the cities and in the urban areas where 
you know, I, and I really think now mental health issues are going to be really important for us to take a look at um, as we kind of come out of this and hopefully the curve curve flattens. Well said. Um, you, I, I, I am a, a political junkie. Um, out of the University of Virginia, my first job was a journalist. I'm a news guy at heart. I love covering the local races. I love just following them. I love covering the congressional race. I just, I love it. I have not seen, um, in my 20 years in this area, I have not seen a race have such little attention. And we know why it has such little attention. It's because of COVID-19 and because yeah. a lot of the media resources are being allocated to how our community is surviving and how Virginians are surviving in a COVID-19 yeah. ecosystem. But I'm mm -hmm. going to throw this to you. We know that the district right now has got an edge to the Republicans with how it's, how it's drawn. Sure. I absolutely. would. I would think that we gotta as, as, as the Democrats, you, the just the party as a whole, has got to figure out a way to get to the forefront and kind of wave the flag and say, "Hey, we have four people here are running, and they're quality candidates." I'm gonna get out of your way on that topic. Yeah. Uh, well, you know, speaking about uh, you know my personal experience in running here, obviously very different. Uh, you know, you can't shake hands and kiss babies. I get you a lot of trouble these days. Um, that's a little bit tongue in cheek, but seriously, we've had to do things uh, very differently. And we understand that. Being uh, distracted and going back to some of the basics of, uh, you know, whether that's uh, direct mail or postcards or phone calling some of the old school methods, but certainly, you know, what we're doing here together and uh, Zoom formats, town halls. I've got one a town hall uh, was tonight with someone on with American Promise. We're going to talk about uh, campaign finance reform. So we're all having to uh, figure out different ways to try to get our message out, try to get uh, in front of the people because we know that, uh, you know, our primary is about three and a half weeks out and uh, we're very concerned about what that turnout like so uh yeah and back to your one you know original question uh it is a tough district it's a tough district for democrats uh i'm the only democrat uh, that was elected onto my board of supervisors i'm in a republican 55 45 county and so you know i've been elected twice in that county um, I had to work across the aisle with uh, some moderate Republicans to form a majority and get things done on the board of supervisors. So, you know, my what I bring to the table is experience and having been able to reach across the aisle and I think appeal to some of those voters that we're going to need here in November, you know, to flip the fifth district. Uh, we're going to need 10, 12,000 of them that we didn't get in 2018. So that's a big part of why I think I'm the right person, uh, the right candidate to, to carry the flag for the Democrats in November. Um, I appreciate you joining us here. The connection a little spotty, but I still want to spend some more time with you and ask you some questions, John. Um, separate what is uh, the differentiating point or some of the differentiating points with you and some of your opponents in the, uh, in the Democratic Party? Well, three and a half weeks away, it's a short window. Why should folks vote for you? Well, I've lived in Virginia for 35 years and I've been in business for 35 years. Um, and I've had my own I had my small business for seven of those years. You know, we get, uh, you know, when we flatten this pandemic, we get out of this pandemic, we find a vaccine, whether it's a, a year out or 18 months out, regardless, we're going to be dealing with the effects of this uh, pandemic on our economy, you know, for an extended period of time. And so I really think that voters need to look at who's got that business background, who's got that experience of, of leadership, not only on the military side, but on the business side. Um, was responsible for uh, in an international company of uh, running a Washington, D.C. metropolitan operation for a real estate firm. So I've certainly led before. But we've got to, uh, you know, we've got to restart this economy smartly, follow the governor's, uh, follow the governor's phased, phased approach while not reigniting this virus. And then I really think that the key here is going to be to rebuild uh, our country pass an infrastructure bill that will put a lot of people back to work, a green infrastructure bill. I mean, you see the dam that collapsed in Michigan, the water system also in Michigan and Flint. You know, our, our uh, infrastructure around here is crumbling, and we can also add a rural broadband component to that, really have a, an investment like a Marshall Plan type of investment 
in infrastructure to include rural broadband because that's really been exposed here as an equality issue, which is another thing that Democrats stand for. And what I certainly focus on is equality because without that uh, broadband, you know, you have haves and have nots in education and telehealth, healthcare, uh, applying for a job, uh, attracting businesses into your community. So we got to get people back to work. We got 40 million of them out of work. And I think voters would really, um, it's going to resonate with them to focus on a candidate that's got a business background, that's got a plan to get people back to work. And um, you could fix health care in doing that too, by the way. I, 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 think, I think you're in a very smart to leverage the business background at this time. And I think, I hope voters understand the value of someone with that background at this time when so many Virginians are out of work, when a quarter of Virginians are either out of work or underpaid or undervalued in some capacity. It's crazy, guys. Right. One in four of us. So let me throw this to you here. Um, this, is, this is an important race. You have um, a platform that people can get around. You got people in Martinsville and Lynchburg watching right now. I see folks in Nelson watching. I'm being told folks in Richmond, Charlottesville, and Almaro watching. So I'm going to throw this to you. If you happen to get the W in the primary, then you're going what the tea leaves would say is probably Bob Good in the, you know, a head-to-head -head battle, right? That's probably what the tea leaves say here. How does a Democrat, and this is just a question for Democrats, how does a Democrat win the primary and then stand a chance in the race, in the election? Well, uh, you, stand, you stand a chance of winning in the primary by convincing Democrats that you're the best candidate to win in the general. I really think that's what we have to focus on is let's take a look at what we've got to do to flip this in, in November. Um, you know, if it is Bob Good, uh, you know, it's going to be a, um, you know, I want to call it a bloodletting, but it's going to be a very, very tough, very tough campaign. Uh, you've got a real conservative here who's going to be bringing up some real uh, fire breathing uh, in his rhetoric and he's going to be bringing um, uh, you know uh, some policies forward I think he quoted as saying I'm going to bring some judeo-christian values back to Washington DC I think you're going to be looked at a clock moving back with a guy like Bob Good on women's reproductive health issues uh, uh, LGBTQIA issues uh, all of those social issues that we've been making progress on uh, are certainly going to, are, are certainly going to be uh, uh, turned back with a, with a candidate like Bob Good. Look, I've, like I said, I've been three times now. Uh, I ran against Todd Gilbert in 2009 in the 15th district of the House of Delegates, uh, Rappahannock, Page, and Shenandoah counties. You can't get any more in the Commonwealth, you know, than getting out into the valley. Got a little nasty. Got a little dirty, um, and you're going to have to. You're going to have a family, uh, and that you are going to be under scrutiny, and are going to come under attack. A little hard. You got to be battle tested. You got, uh, and that's that's another thing that uh, that's certainly something you know that I bring to the equation, and, and I think that voters uh, will look at seriously as they try to figure out who the best can to take. Good answer to that question right there. Um, I, I want to spend so much more time with you. The connection is a little spotty, um, John. Okay. Yeah, but but you have you have questions coming in though. I want to get to some of these questions. Okay. Here's a question. Here's a question that's coming from a, a viewer in Lynchburg. Um, Jerry, please ask your guests um, about how uh, Virginia Governor Ralph Northam has handled this. Does your guest think he's done a good job or a bad job? If he could give us some insight. Yeah, I think the governor has done, uh, he's done an adequate job. You know, I uh, wasn't necessarily caught without wearing a mask over the weekend out in Virginia Beach. Uh, you know, that you always want, you always want to show that you're leading from the front. You know, I realized it was outside, but on the other hand, it wasn't respect for social distancing. So I see, you know, some momentary, momentary lapses there, we, you know, are most unfortunate. You know, I I do commend him for getting out in front of a lot of and uh, closing the Virginia schools, I think, earlier than a lot of states did, recognizing as a doctor that, uh, you know, you listen to the health expert uh, and you have to uh, get out in front of this. Uh, I like his phased, phased plan. I like the fact that, uh, and this comes really from the locality, you know, that Northern Virginia didn't really feel it was ready for phase one, you know, until this week. 
and I think he's listening to the to the rules. Um, so for the most part, I don't think we give him uh, you know give him relatively high marks. I I commend, and I think the thing you look for here is the governor that is uh, is going to listen to the health experts, to the medical experts, follow their guidance. Don't follow the leadership and the nonsense coming out of uh, coming out of the White House and the administration. Um, so for those reasons, uh, you know, I, I would uh, say Governor Northam has done a pretty good job. Okay. Okay. Why don't we do this? Um, I, I want to get you back on here and spend some extended time with you. Like I said, the connection's a little spotty. Why don't we close with this? Give um, the folks that are watching um, the reason why to vote for you, why, why you're the right choice. And we'll close on that. Sure. Thanks, Jerry. And, you know, I apologize. Uh, you're coming in loud and clear on my end, so I don't... Uh, uh, I'm not sure what's, uh, what, what the challenge is, but I can appreciate that uh, in, in these in these times when we're all doing this, you know, the technology uh, we're we're uh, kind of a slave to the to the technology. I, I will leave this with your voters. Um, I, I'm a candidate of vision. I, I really th I believe that we are at a crossroads. We are at a tipping point uh, in American history right now in our country. Uh, things could not you know, things were already um, uh, you know, in, in a situation of needing uh, uh, new uh, health care, cha changes in health care, changes in, in how we view equality, the pandemic has only put that under the microscope all the more. We can come out of this pandemic with a vision of making uh, our country and our society a better place. We can fix health care once and for all and not make it based on, on job based. You know, the fact we have 40 million out of work right now, a lot of those folks are added to the 30 million role folks that don't have health care in this country. I'm for improving the Affordable Care Act, adding a public option and fast tracking to uni universal care. I'm also for fighting climate change. And this pandemic is a canary in the coal mine for what happens to you when you don't plan properly, when you don't have a strategic vision. Uh, we've got to look at that with respect to climate change, wean ourselves off of fossil fuels, re-align re, uh, this economy to uh, focus on renewable energy sources, wind, solar, battery technology, electric vehicles, reduce our carbon footprint, get ourselves back into the Paris Agreement, know that global warming is real, and follow the science. We have a real, if we, are, we as Democrats are able to run the table in November, and control government, we have the, the um, historic possibility of changing uh, the way we do things now, clearly for the better, and solve some of the horrible inequalities that we have in our in our in our society and in our system today. I, that, I recognize that coming in here, and that's that's the vision that I have, and the understanding that these are the problems that we need to face as uh, as Americans and as leaders. And I can provide that leadership. I like it. Um, I appreciate your time. I'm going to reach out to Dave, your campaign manager. We'll see if we can get another one of the books, spend some more time. Um, I enjoy uh, getting to know you. I wish you the best of luck. We're going to have uh, Dr. Webb on tomorrow, um, same forum where it's open-ended questions. See if mm -hmm. we can get uh, Claire and, uh, and, and RD on as well. Um, thank you. Uh, you have a good afternoon. Stay safe. Thanks, Jerry, and uh, happy to come back if uh, we need to do this again. Yeah, we will. We will. You have a good one. Thank you so much. Um, connection a little choppy, uh, but I think he had, you know, was saying a lot of, a lot of, a lot, a lot of the right things. Um, I think the Democrats are in an extremely uphill battle. There's been no attention on this race. You have to be very concerned about uh, voter turnout. Very concerned about voter turnout. Because if we're afraid to go to the grocery store and we're uncertain to go to the playground, playgrounds are closed. There's yellow tape around playgrounds in the Charlottesville, Almoral County area. And that's what, Central Virginia is what, about a third of the voting of the fifth? That's probably a high. It, it's, it's, it's a good chunk, but it's not half, okay? So if moms and, and dads and people are afraid to go to the playground with their two-year-old son, Will they go in three and a half weeks and vote in a primary when the media has allocated all its attention and spotlight to COVID-19 and not the candidates in the primary? I, it's intriguing. 
I have not seen a race with such little coverage in my 20 years in the fifth as I've seen with this one. And it makes sense. You know, you have a pandemic in COVID-19, and, and, and John's right. You have a pandemic in COVID-19 that has magnified, and we'll switch over here, Judah. Eliza Whiteman coming up, Fly Dog Yoga. Eliza Whiteman in about five minutes if you're watching, Eliza. We'll hit you up. In fact, I'll Skype text you here, uh, 1 15 p.m. So you have a pandemic, John is right, our guess, that is magnified and amplified cracks in a foundation and worsened the cracks in the foundation. You had a good chunk of Virginians and a good chunk of Americans and a good chunk of Charlottesvillians already living on margin or paycheck to paycheck, floating from every, other, every second Friday, hoping, praying to get to the every other Friday. And this pandemic has amplified all those cracks in the foundation and made them much worse. 30, 40 million people in America, out of work, underpaid, undervalued. Stock market's performing great, though. <laughs> 12 and a half, 13 percent of the population of our country uncertain about their income stream, yet Wall Street, your portfolio, my portfolio, portfolios everywhere showing green across the board. It's a crazy time. And we're going into an important race in the fifth that it really looks like from reading the tea leaves, Bob Good and the Republican Party are pretty much controlling the outcome of what happens here. That's crazy. We'll follow it. Cameron Webb tomorrow, the good doctor from the University of Virginia. He's, I said it to, in, in my opening statements on the show. Of the, four, in the, of the four Democrats in the primary, because of the podcast that he's doing with Dr. Bell, I think Cameron Webb's had the most visibility of, of Claire Russo, R.D. Hofstetler, and John Lisinski. Three and a half weeks left. Judah, I'm going to go to Eliza Whiteman, Fly Dog Yoga, and I'm excited to welcome her to the program. She is the, uh, the owner of this yoga studio behind Barracks Road Shopping Center. It's ringing now, Judah. They've done an amazing job of taking an in-person business and making that in-person business um, a digital uh, community. And they've taken their clients and their offerings and they've created a, a, a virtual um, offering, a virtual base. And I wanna talk to her about that. We'll talk about survival. She's gonna get anybody that's watching this show to be able to run through fire. She's an inspiration. She's a spitfire. I, th I think you have a, a, a gaggle of children. I'm going to ask her about that because we have one child and we're struggling with that. <laughs> uh, so she's on the line, Judah. He's giving us the thumbs up. Eliza, you are live for Charlottesville in Central Virginia. How are you doing? How are you managing? How's everything going? We got you there, Eliza. Can you hear me? Judah, can you hear Hey, we got you. Can you hear me, Eliza? You're live. No? Let's see if we can try to get her back. I'll try calling you back here in 15 seconds. Um, you didn't catch audio on the back end there? No, I can't hear. Okay. I'm going to try calling her back now, and we'll see if we can get her. Okay. She's picking up. We... Oh, we got you. Can you see me? Okay, you're live, Eliza. Yeah. I, I'm hoping the technology holds up here. Like John said, we're at the mercy here. You're live. How are you holding up? Give us some, some insight, baby. Hey. Um, yeah, we're, uh, we're hanging in there. We're uh, making, it, making it work. Yeah. <laughs> as best we can. What was the, give us some insight into the, uh, into the, the pivot. Um, we were scared into the vulnerability. All this is happening. Can't open for business. You guys are an in-person, interacting business. You know, the restaurant's getting a lot of the attention. Yoga studios should be getting mm -hmm. attention, too. Give us some insight into that vulnerability you were fearing. 
Uh, man, well, I do have to say, like, yeah, so we we were on with you uh, in January. Yeah. We on with you. Yeah. And things were going so well, Jerry. Things were great. <laughs> And uh, really, like, in they doing a bunch of things. And I went out to a conference um, in California. And I remember coming back. And it's a totally different world. I came back, like, on a Friday, March 12th. That's when they announced all the schools were going to be closed, right? And we had to make, like, a, you know, a split snap decision on what are we going to do. Um, so it really came down to to that. We made the announcement with UVA and then with the public schools, and we were like, we can't just we can't wait for this. We're going to have to make a decision. So I will I will say I will preface this with we had the intention of moving things online, moving our operation online. That was like a big goal for us. And it, we were always stuck. Oh my gosh, we just don't have time. We just don't have. We kept pushing it back, right? So this opportunity had uh, <laughs> presented itself. That um, we were going to absolutely move everything online, and we made that decision in, in a week. Of this is what we have to do. We cancel all of our classes, and now we're going to totally pivot live stream with our classes. Wow. And we did that in a weekend turnaround of preparing for that. Um, and so all of our classes, we moved them live stream, and then we then focused on our on demand our on demand platform. So as it stands right now, I think we have thirty classes that are live stream. So our teachers come into our studio, and we film. You know in real time right there on zoom um and there's that there's that aspect of connection we can talk back and forth people really like that opportunity uh -huh. and then we also have the the on demand which people can access at any time and so now with on demand classes we have close to 50 classes now that we've in the last couple of months have put on so small segments to full classes um and then we're even getting even into wellness, nutrition, meditation, all of that stuff. So that was our big bit. And, you know, at first we're like, oh my gosh, so stressed out that we were going to have to do this for a couple of weeks. Oh, three months now <laughs> into this world. And this is where we are right now. And, and that's the, the, the biggest part right now is not knowing not knowing what phase, not knowing what we're going to do, being in the service industry and, and, and the part of that service industry of even smaller niche of being like health and wellness. What do we, we're, we're held to like a different standard within that health and well, or, uh, in that service industry. So now I feel like we have bigger decisions that kind of, that weigh on me as to what is best for my staff, what is best for our community being not even a gym, but like a closed container kind of operation. So that is, Man. that's our stress. That's our stress with it right now. It's like, what are we doing? Right. What phase are we going to be in? I don't know how to plan. Right. Is it right now or is it 12 weeks? Because if it's 12 weeks, I've, I've got to pivot again. I've got to take a next level up with, on with, um, on, on, you know, online, I have to take the next step up if we're going 12 weeks because I can't sit in right now as it is. So what do we plan for? Well, I, 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 dude, I have so much props for you and I have so much props and respect for anyone that's like a small business owner right now. It's freaking scary times out there and we're having to like yeah. literally reinvent ourselves. So I'll throw this topic to you. Do we think the future of the space is digital first, virtual first or not? That's a great question. That's what we're discussing right now. Uh, and I think, right, again, I have, I just have no idea with what phase we're in and what is our mindset. Because if it is something, I mean, but theoretically right now, we, it could be open for business on Saturday if you wanted to. Yeah. And we're not even ready for that right now, but we don't know. So if that is, if we're in a phase two, which honestly, I, I don't believe so. But if we are phase two, 
then, well, now we've got to figure out how we're going to do this in person and also live stream because we would continue to do that. So, so now we've got to figure out how are we going to clean extensively? How are we going to, you know, close off bathrooms, like emergency only bathroom use, like limit everything. So how do we do that? And then also live stream. So that would be a mix. Is, or is it, we, is it, is it two different businesses in some ways? It could be. Yeah. And that's where we're going with it. Yes. Yeah, because you could do, and this is crazy. I'm just spitballing with you. You could do yeah. the, uh, you could do that, like the digital paid membership, where you do the offerings and they can do them from home. That's its own silo or revenue stream. And then yeah, you yeah, could yeah. have the in person, and then the in person could have like the add on with the virtual. Like if you're an in person member, then you automatically get this. But you could yeah. do the virtual separate. I'm gonna get out of your way. You've obviously thought this out. I'm curious. I'm learning from you. Keep, <laughs> keep educating us, please, please. <laughs> No, no, no. That's that. That's it. Those are the conversations, you know, Brad and I are, are having right now and with our community. Yeah, that's that's it. That's where we're going with it for sure. And, you know, my, my husband is he loves the technology piece. Or he yeah enjoys kind of figuring it out. And he, and he absolutely has that vision of, you no, know, we're going next level with it this is where we're going. So right. Right now, just as you said, you laid out all those options. Yes, yes, we are in all of those options to produce the best quality. We have the best teachers doing the best they can, presenting all sorts of different things. So yes, yes, we are in that whole mix. And now it's like, but are we going to open in this phase? Or are we 12 weeks out? And if we're 12 weeks out, then we're going to have to totally flip the script right now and go all in on digital because right now um like this this was kind of pasted together right this is kind of pasted all together in an effort to like right. wait it out and now and now it's getting to the point like uh we you you're either going next level or you're still going to kind of keep trying to scrape it out i don't know what the fall is going to bring you don't know what it's going to do are we preparing now for that? Interesting. So all in on digital, you said we would go all in on digital if it's 12, if we're 12 mm -hmm. weeks out, does that mean, does that yep. mean no brick and mortar or does that mean just the focus is super hardcore just on yeah. digital? Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 So super, super hardcore. And maybe, I mean, we're already shifting around like brick and mortar, like our studio right now and kind of moving things around to, I mean, it's option in our studio right now. It is the lights, the camera, the layout, the table, like everything. So we've already switched things around. I mean, uh, but yeah, having to reconsider what the space is for 12 weeks down the road, you know, be a whole production facility. <laughs> you guys are so awesome. You guys are such ballers. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I doing the production, like having the technology studio in, in, in your business is going to be crucial for building the brand. I think somebody in the yoga space is going to end up being like the P90X of yoga, where someone can own the space and be the big brand in yoga, where mm -hmm. they can say like for $34.95 a month, or whatever it is, you pay us, yeah. we'll give you 35 different classes on demand, um, and, and you can take them at your leisure, in your pajamas, at your home if you want. Um, and I think right. people are going to do that. But I think what makes your brand so great, and I saw that and I've heard that, especially when you came on the show, is people love the in-person connection. People love right. being around you guys. How about, how about Spotlight That? Give us some of the stories you've heard about that. Oh, I mean, it's... It's just the it's the connection of it, and that's what we're we're losing, the the connection of being around people physically, but also the inaction of things. And so, what's worked really well with us, I mean, as soon as we had to go, you know, online and and quarantine and lockdown, then I put on, you know, uh, our forty days program. So it's taking the classes and meditation and um, kind of inquiry and journaling to like keep yourself connected to yourself because as you've seen this locked has really done a number on people um on their on their just well-being and so we did that program pretty early on and it was just so great 
for people to come together. And I've also, I'm leading trainings. I'm So I've taken in my trainings i do 200 hour teacher trainings and advanced teacher trainings nice. and i put all of those on gotta tell you i was really worried about it but, but that whole connection of it i was able to do the same things i would be in person but it, it you know and there's some cons with it but really being able to um to get the work out of people and again it's it's talking with people, being with them, kind of acknowledging them. Because we're locked away, and we're not getting that sense of acknowledgement and feeling. Um, so that was a big one. And then we've also really flipped with corporate, corporate private sessions for corporations and businesses because the well-being of their employees being a huge shift. And I know yoga is seen as like, an extra right it's, a, it's an extra expense but as you've seen with with everyone it, it really is um needed and in, and we're, we're starting to lose that a little bit as we're like mm, that's extra but as other businesses and corporations are starting to see like the well-being of their employees to come together the team building aspect of getting everyone together whether it's breathing or kind of like basics of meditation and, and moving together, build up morale for the company, for their employees. So that's another keeping in contact with our teachers and just talking about what's going on, that connection. That's what made a difference. I like it. I like your style. I like your style. Um, I like that you're willing to try stuff and I like that you're willing to just like throw it against the wall and see if it works. And if it does, just keep going harder down that road. Um, I love that. Um, I think you guys are awesome. Um, can I throw this to you as a small business mm -hmm. owner? Like the, the Venn diagram that was circulating with the circles, whether it's like the safety of humans we want, the 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 pressure the 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 saving of the small businesses that people have worked so hard we want um, the concern that we have for government taking control of our life you know the, and then there's, there's this middle point where we all can be in let yeah right in the middle. can we can mm -hmm. I throw that to you because it was so hard with like I'm such a champion and just like you of the small business community I'm also a champion of people staying alive <laughs> and being healthy. Can I throw that to you and get out of your way and get your take on it? It's such a tricky predicament and it's really interesting with everybody putting out their, their thoughts to things. However, when you are the one that it falls on, that takes a pretty heavy toll on you. And so for these last couple of weeks, just kind of floundering in the, are we going to open or not? What does that mean? That, that stresses me out. And so that's what I feel like really deep down. That was what, that is my worry. And so for me, it's not just, oh yeah, let's go to the restaurants. So I get that. I get that. And oh, we need to open up the businesses and then it needs to be everybody's choice. And I'm like, Ugh, I get that too. <laughs> but, you know, for me trying to take proactive steps to doing the best I can to keep everybody safe and having those protocols in place. And then, you know, if I'm doing that, I kind of expect that other people as well. And so there would be a frustration if it's just like a free for all, you know, why am I holding myself to these standards when the other places are not. And so there's a little bit of, you know, what's the, what's the right way for us? And then are we not getting as many people because it's, you know, do you know what I mean? Oh, I know exactly there's what you mean. Thoughts. Yeah. I know exactly what you mean. You're basically, am I getting as many people if my standards are so strict that people may not come, right. but at the same time, you got to keep your standards strict because people expect it. It's so hard for the small business owner. And I feel like the small business owner is, is, is such a brutal predicament here. We have no yeah. clear, no clear certainty or like from the governor's office. I'm going to give him a little grief from here. He could have done a better job communicating here. Um, the mask, wearing mask inside in public places. The business owner is now going to be having to focus on this 
or have masks there, which we all should be wearing masks, but some people won't. I mean, I just feel like it, the, the small business owner who has people counting on him or her for their lives is in such a tough spot right now. Well, and my, my other thing, my other thing that I brought up, and, and I keep saying maybe I'm overanalyzing this, maybe I'm overthinking this, is my concern on protocol. I don't have guidelines and protocols for what happens if one of my teachers um, or a student a couple of weeks after being in the studio and into classes, what if they come up and say, oh, I'm sick. I test positive. I'm sick. So then what are my protocols there? Because now do I have to contact everyone that was in that class? Everyone that is in that class from this point on, hundreds of people maybe, um, do I have to close down my studio for two weeks? Do I have to do deep clean and get a fogger? And and so I'm going through all this, like what is the protocol? And though I just started thinking about this, so if everyone's reopening, if we're all going through this, is our our action in three months like yeah you get it you get it whatever you know is it, is it not as as much like if you go into the gym and you're just like yeah that's you know if I if I get it I get it but then someone your teacher that you took with ends up the next week is positive is if you get the email are you upset or are you like well. And you can't test because testing is tough to get. What do you do? What are our protocols? That's and that's what I don't know. Right. God. No. Oh, my goodness. Oh, <laughs> what do I, you do? I so know. Like, it's, even for Brad and I, like, if we're in the studio, if I'm in the studio, he's got it, too. You know? Right. If we're in that, the predicament. So we can't come into the studio. So two weeks. What do you do? Same thing with you. If you're at the gym and your teacher comes back and is like, oops, I tested positive. I taught your class. I don't know. So are you, what, are you out? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. Right? I have no idea. This, she's, she is exactly right. She's exactly <laughs> right. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know. Um, and I think, unfortunately, I mean, I, unfortunately, the leadership has to start from the top where we should know. We should know what the plan is. She should yeah. know what to do. We should, but we don't because we're not getting it from the top. All right, why don't we close on this? You're amazing. Um, <laughs> anywhere you want to go, um, Charlottesville's watching. We are a platform of hope and positivity. We're realists, yeah. and this has been hard as hell, as we all know. Um, show is yours. Give us some, spit some fire, lady. Spit some fire. You know what? Um, I've, I've had my peaks and my valleys with this. And it's like not a full day. You know, it's not a full day. It's like moments. A bad moment. A great moment, you know. Like you said, my gaggle of children. Um, I, I have these ups and downs with this whole situation with everything. And, um, and I just keep my mindset, my husband's mindset is what, what else can I do? What can I do to add value? What can I do to on to my members, to bring them in, to build my community? That is my focus. And if I get down in the weeds about memberships or this or that, or are we opening? Or are we not that drag down and makes me so much uh, less productive than anything. I have to constantly, uh, you know, be aware that, ooh, I'm going down this slippery slope. Like, get it together, shake it off, and, like, get into action. What, No matter what the action is, if it's a walk, if it's a, a yoga class, like, I need to be in some kind of productive mindset or I go, I go down to this pit of despair. Amen. And it is... It is tough down there. And so we're still in this mindset, like, we're going. We're doing this. We're going to figure this out. And and that's the way it has to be. Like, I don't know another way if, if I'm just like, eh, it's too much. We're just going to not do this. You know, we're just going, I don't know. I don't, there's no other way. We have to make this work. And it's normal to be like, everything is overwhelming. 
and I have to find the little things to like take that next step away from that slope because it is easy to slide back down. So that is, that is my, that is my message. If, if right now it doesn't have to be a big thing, I'm not saying you need to go, you know, read war and peace or finish, you know, write your book or <laughs> I'm not saying that it's little things and we've got to keep doing the little things to keep building up to the big things. Cause this is, it can be so overwhelming, but it's, it's action. Like what action will you take today? Big or small to see up out of the muck. Man. Don't get a muck. You are good. Um, I'm going to give you some props too. Is it the, the phenom podcast? Yeah. She's got a podcast that I, I was listening to. I think her name was Nikki Zellner on her podcast. Yes. Her yes. podcast is on iTunes. Listen to her podcast. Mm. You, will, you will be inspired. She's amazing. Um, thank you for joining us. I think you're a truly a rock star. I think I, I cannot wait to see you and Brad own the digital and virtual yoga space. And become the P90X or the Peloton <laughs> or the Peloton of yoga nationally. Because someone's going to do it. And I want that someone to be you in Charlottesville, Virginia. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for coming on the show. Thanks, yeah, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. You have a good one, Eliza. She's amazing. Hey. Um, she's very, very, very good. The uh, video on, uh, on, uh, on our two guests, a little choppy, but the audio, very, very good. We hope you enjoyed today's program. Tomorrow's guest is Dr. Cameron Webb, who's running for Congress. He, you probably know as a UVA doctor, um, and he, along with Tyson Bell, have done, a doctor as well, have done a fantastic job in a virtual podcast streaming capacity on Facebook of offering approachability and knowledge and transparency and education when it comes to the COVID metrics in our community, nationally, regionally, locally, and ways to survive, ways to manage. So he's on tomorrow's show, which I'm excited about. We'll reach out to Bob Good and Denver Riggleman and RD and Claire as well as we try to put a spotlight on a race that's really important. You've got a race that's going to be decided, a primary that's going to be decided um, in the Democrats in three and a half weeks, a convention, which w the tea leaves say it's going to be Bob, um, a convention on the horizon, and then an election in November, and a critically important one as we try to recover in this COVID landscape. So the leadership is going to help us recover. And you really saw that magnet, you really saw that spotlighted and magnified um, with Ralph Northrum, our governor. Our governor, uh, I'm choosing my words carefully. And I rarely, you know, I don't like doing that. Um, our governor, I think, has left a lot to be decide, de desired with his communications me communication methods um, with this situation. There's no clarity. There's no, there's no, there's no clear cut. There's no clear cut of this is what we're going to do. Okay, this is how it's going to play out. You heard it there from Eliza. There's no clarity. I'm not wearing a mask at the beach. No clarity. I'm not wearing a mask at the beach, and then on Tuesday you're saying wear a mask? Come on. Come on. Come on. This topic is something I'm going to continue on the show, and it's resonating now with viewership of Albemarle County and its Board of Supervisors and its leadership needing to be a little open-minded about expanding the designated strategic growth area because the restaurants, the lodging, the tourism, and the retail, um, they're not going to rebound quickly in Charlottesville or the county anywhere. Restaurant, lodging, tourism, retail is not going to rebound. So figure out other ways to generate incremental revenue. I think it's going to have to be through the strategic development. We'll talk about that on the show. Maybe we'll reach out to Neil. Maybe I get Rory Stolzenberg in the mix on this program. My name is Jerry Miller. This is the I Love Seville Show. We'll see you tomorrow at 1230 with Dr. Cameron Webb. Take care.